All right, y'all take your Bibles, if you would, and open to the second chapter of 1 John. Um, We're going to press on tonight. We're going to be looking this evening at verses um, 18 through 23. Um, We are having Bible study next week. Trey will be leading it, um, but uh, we are having it. You probably won't be doing 1 John, all right? So you'll get something a little bit different, but it'll be good. You'll enjoy it. so, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It'll it'll be good. He'll he'll do a good job. So I always enjoy getting to have them come and do that with us. Uh, so we're going to be in First John chapter two, verses eighteen through twenty-two tonight, as we kind of move on um, in our study. Uh, all home folks tonight, I don't see anybody that hadn't been with us before in this study, so I don't think there's a need for me to go over all the background material um, as normally I do. Uh, I have one slide up there that has that on that, sir, if you want to put that slide up there just so if anyone wants that, they can look at it uh, that has some of the background material here. Uh, just kind of a quick reminder, do remember that this is a letter written by the Apostle John, the beloved disciple. Uh, There's several Johns in the New Testament, um, but that's the one that this is by. Uh, Do remember that he wrote several of our books that will be significant tonight. Uh, Wrote the Gospel of John as well as these three letters that we're focusing on in this study and the book of Revelation. Uh, There is some overlap in those books. Um, John has uh, favorite phrases and words and topics that he likes to talk about, and that's going to be the center of one of the topics, of, of, of the topic that we're going to kind of be looking at tonight. Um, so if you have your Bible there, if you want to go ahead and turn to that, um, we'll start with the passage of Scripture, and then uh, kind of got some uh, preliminary kind of thought-provoking discussion things for us tonight that I think will make sense as we get into the study tonight. So if, you, if you're there with me, look at First John chapter 2, uh, beginning in verse 18. Uh, and I'm going to read on down to verse 23 um, for us, and then we'll get into this a little bit, uh, pick this passage apart some tonight. Um, titled um, this study tonight, um, Avoiding Spiritual Deception. So a good topic. That's, that's kind of what you're going to hear him discussing uh, in this passage of Scripture. Uh, so verse 18 in chapter 2 starts with, Uh, One of the favorite phrases of John, little children, and remember we've already talked about this because he's mentioned it several times up to where we are today. He's talking about believers, children of God, um, um, growing in their faith. Um, So that's, that's what that is. So verse 18, little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now... Many antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest or shown that none of them were of us. Some important verses here. But you, little children, children of God, have, look at this, an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. Um, So when God saves us, and remember, know is one of His favorite words, um, He gives us, through the Holy Spirit, an ability to be discerning, to be wise, to recognize what's false. Uh, We we must not deny that, okay? So that's a very important phrase there, um, that He's given us this anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. Verse 21, I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist, who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. So you can tell that this is a pretty important passage of Scripture as a part of John's purpose for writing this letter was to deal with false teachers um, of the day that it infiltrated the early church. Um, But some significant things in this passage, uh, there's that 
powerful mention several times in there of the Antichrist that's coming and the Antichrists that are already present. And this causes lots of um, uneasiness with people, lots of questions, um, lots of subjective thinking. Who is this? I know that in my lifetime, um, all kinds of people have been accused of being the Antichrist, right? Um, even in my lifetime and yours. Um, and so always that topic, I, I think, um, kind of brings up um, some questions in our minds, kind of some wondering, uh, because Scripture never quite tells us who that is, although Scripture tells us what that one that is the Antichrist or the Antichrists who are present now gives us real indicators of what they do and what they're like. Because we know, and the Holy One, through what He's revealed in Scripture, helps us to be wise. And that's, that's really important for us when we think about the times that we're living in today and the spiritual deception that we can see even in our time that's taking place. And, and there are many today, and some of you know them because you have conversations with them. Some of them may be in your family who seem to be spiritually deceived um, by some things. So uh, I think a timely study for us um, but I want to talk about some of these things as we're getting started because those few verses in verses 18 through 23 seem really pertinent for us um, even today. And, and I do think um, that all of Scripture um, was written for a specific time and a specific people in specific situations. But I also believe that Scripture still is relevant and applies and speaks to where we are today. So Although you can read this and I can give you all the background and the historical information behind it, what's really important is what's in it for us in navigating a world today that seems to be plagued with spiritual deception. Um, how do we avoid it? How do we help others avoid it? How do we recognize it? Well, we've already been told in Scripture, um, right here in our passage of Scripture, um, that we've been anointed with the Holy One. So within us, we have the ability to be discerning and recognizing um, of what is false. Um, but we have to use that, okay? We, we can deny it. We can look the other way, and we ourselves can be deceived, which we're going to see tonight. So we have to learn how to use that. So here's some, just some preliminary kind of application questions for discussion. I just want to talk about these a little bit. Um, I think sometimes the questions that these studies ask um, can be pretty deep, and so I want to give you time to think about them. But, but this first one, I think, is a really good question for us to think about. Um, it's real clear in this passage of Scripture that, that in, on some level, John is encouraging us as believers to kind of open our eyes and be discerning, um, to see the spirit of the age, um, to recognize what's false. It seems like that's what he's warning these little children about, you know, that there are, the Antichrist is coming and there are Antichrists in the world even then as there are today. And, and he's kind of encouraging them to be discerning. So think about this. What is the difference, do you think, if any, um, be between being discerning and being distrustful? It's a good question. I mean, I don't think he expects us to navigate life by being a skeptic and having a skeptic's attitude about everything. I, I think we ought to be critical thinkers. I think we ought to be discerning. But what's, what's the difference, if any, do you think, between being discerning and being distrustful? Thoughts? Okay. If you don't trust someone, you have doubts about what they're saying. Yeah. Okay. If you're not discerning, can you be distrustful? I would think so. Yeah. Yeah. 
Th think about this a little bit because this may help you answer this question. And the question is still, so these are some underlying thoughts here that might help, help us kind of answer this, this question about what is the difference, if any, between being discerning and being distrustful. And maybe it's trying to define those two things. So um, one of the things it asks in here, kind of as a sub-question of that first one, is um, what has a tendency to make us distrustful? Think about your own life and think about the age we live in. Think about what, what is it that has a tendency to make us distrustful? Yeah, that's right, right? So, so usually right or wrong, and sometimes we're the ones in the wrong, right? But right or wrong, it's usually some circumstance that's happened in our life that makes us distrustful of someone or something, right? We've, we've been in a bad situation. We've we or not yeah we've that's right so so you see that right like for example if if a politician constantly lies to you it's the best example i can think of because it's where we're living right now if a politician constantly lies to you how do you feel about them i don't trust them right do, do you see what i'm saying um if if you go to a doctor and a doctor just kind of keeps putting you off and they don't help you and you walk out of there time and time again and they're unhelpful to you you don't trust them and what do you do Find a new doctor, right? So think about that. Distrustful has to do with this very kind of fleshly, earthly kind of sense of us judging a situation based on another situation or something that happens. Discernment, on the other hand, what's the difference? What, what makes us discerning? Isn't, isn't it? Yeah, it, it's, it's less tangible, right? Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Think of what we say, and this is what, what, what kind of they're throwing out here. Think of what we say concerning being distrustful or being discerning. If it's distrustful, we say, well, I learned my lesson. I won't trust that again. But if it's discerning, it's, I just don't have a good feeling about it. And it may or may not be based on anything. It just may. And if you're a Christian and the Holy Spirit leaves in you, that's not a feeling. What is it? A prompting, right? So I think it's important for us to distinguish that because he is not calling us here to be skeptical. He's not calling us to that. We, we react to situations when we don't trust someone. And the truth of the matter is sometimes we don't trust someone or a situation, but we're still called to love them and witness to them, and minister to them, and pray for them. Do you see what I'm saying? So, so that's a difference. Discerning, discernment's given to us for a different reason, right? For protection, to steer us in the right direction, to keep us from falling prey to something we ought not to fall prey to as believers. So, so interesting discussion for us when we think about that. Um, so in the area of discernment, why is it so important that a Christian learn to be discerning today? Why is it so important that a Christian, I don't think we have to learn to be distrustful, right? But why is it so important for a Christian to learn to be discerning today? Oh, I could tell you stories, y'all. I wouldn't get through this study. <laughs> people, now you're telling on yourself because most people don't know that about you. Yeah. 
So I'm going to come to you, sir. So the question is, again, you know, yes, Na what Nancy's sharing is important for us to understand. Why is it important for us as believers to be discerning, to develop discernment in our life? Go ahead, Sarah. I think it's because it's really important. Because you can look at what's really happening in the Holy Spirit and what's happening in the world around you and how it's all Okay. Other thoughts about that? Good. Yes. Very good, very good. Yeah, I mean, Sarah knows this because her and Tran Bethany all heard this when they were growing up from Nancy and I. We, we really had a desire when we were raising our kids to teach them to think critically about things. That's not to just be skeptical of everything and be critical of everything, but to read critically, to watch critically, to listen critically, to think critically. And, and even as a pastor, I've always tried to say to my churches, you ought to, you ought to think critically when a preacher preaches. You ought to think critically when I preach. You ought to listen closely be discerning you ought to think critically when you sit under a teacher somewhere when when you read a christian book nancy and i like to read we share titles all the time and sometimes we've talked about this we get into chapter two and we go nope right you should read even what christians write critically you should okay so i think that's important but here's the problem with this whole discernment thing um, discernment is on some of paul's spiritual gifts list so we talk about some people have the gift of discernment. You know, does that let the rest of us off the hook? No. And that's what John's telling us, okay? So, so look at this again because I want you to see this because we've got some questions concerning this. Um, here's, here's what he says. Um, let me get back to it right here. In verse 20, look at it. But you, Christian have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things, okay? So that's really important. Where does discernment come from? It comes from God, the, ho the Holy Spirit in your life. Now remember what we can do to the Holy Spirit as Christians. What can we do? Quench Him, grieve Him, right? So what does that do to our discernment? Why, why is it possible that we can as Christians sometimes be deceived because we don't listen, right? So although I do believe that some have the gift of spiritual discernment, um, I believe that every Christian is gifted by the Holy Spirit to be discerning, and we have to learn to develop that and listen to it. We should be discerning, and I think that's critical in our age. So um, yes, I'm thankful for this passage of Scripture uh, that we're looking at tonight and some of the things that's going to going to tell us. I, I think those are some very relevant questions, and, and um, there's more of them, but we could spend the whole night just talking about all these preliminary questions and we wouldn't get through this. Um, but, but I think um, all of those are relevant questions when you're talking about spiritual deception. How do you, how do you avoid it? What are the warnings that he's giving to, to the little children, Christians here, that are applicable for us? Um, I think we have to say that um, we are living in a day of spiritual deception and that's a very real threat. It's not new, okay? Um, that's obvious by what we're reading, okay? Um, it was obviously present in the early church because this is a present-day article, letter, written to believers in the New Testament church, and it was an issue they were dealing with then, and he's telling them, listen, you have the anointing of the Holy One. You know the truth. You know, be discerning, okay? And then he, but he tells them, be aware that the Antichrist is coming, and even now, 
there are antichrists living among us, okay? They're here. So um, we, we have to recognize that. I do think um, that as we get closer and closer to the coming of the Lord, that spiritual deception will become more pronounced. I do think that today it's pronounced. Um, it's, it's out there. And, and I think if you... Um, I know that probably many of you don't. I think I know John does because we talk about it some. Listen to a lot of different Christian podcasts and different, read a lot of Christian stuff that's out there, things that are going on in churches. There's a lot of spiritual deception in our churches today. And, and you just have to go, why? What, what is that? Um, and, and I think that's what, what John's warning the early church about, and we need to recognize that's not new. There's nothing new under the sun. Um, it may be more pronounced today, which means we need to be more pronounced in our faith. We need to be more grounded. We, we need to be able to recognize what's real and, and what's false. This is a warning that is replete in Scripture. And, and when I pick up on something in Scripture that is, is mentioned over and over and over again under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and God's Word, to me it's like sit up and take notice. You better pay attention. Um, so um, I want to I just share some of these with you. I, I'll read some of them, um, but, but I'm going to give you the verses so that you can go back and look them up. I'm always worried about if I take my time, I'm going to get caught up in one of these passages and won't want to leave it. So let me give you the scriptures here. These are some scriptural warnings concerning spiritual deception in our day, okay? And, and I'm just going to give you the scripture references. I may go back and just um, refer to some of these, uh, but I'm going to give them to you so you can look them up. Uh, the first one is 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2. 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2. Um, and I'll just share with you, verse 1 there, the first part of that just says, now the Spirit, capital S, speaking to the Holy Spirit, the Spirit expressly says to you that in latter times, some will desert the faith and follow deceiving spirits. Okay, the, the Spirit expressly, what do you think he means by that? The, the Spirit expressly says to you that in latter times, that's our times, some will depart from the faith and give heed to deceiving spirits. What, is, what does he mean? Some will expressly. Yeah. 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 Right. The riots, like, that's what you're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The second one is 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, lengthy passage. Um, it's interesting that these are all in a place that we've been, and I think that he includes them here because remember John is writing from Ephesus where Timothy pastored, and all of these are from Timothy, which he saw the same thing in his day, right? Uh, Paul knew that was apparent there, um, and John's writing this letter to Christians in Ephesus in that surrounding area, okay? Uh, 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, um, in, in that passage of Scripture, he says that um, perilous times will come when men will follow deceiving spirits. Um, I, th I think we see that. Uh, the third one is 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4. And, and, and in that passage of Scripture, again, that's just two verses. 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4. Y'all can go back and study these and look them up as a part of the study. Um, he says in there that the time will come when men will not endure sound doctrine, but will follow deceiving spirits. Which says to me, we need to be grounded in the doctrine of God's word, the truth, so that we don't get tripped up in that, okay? Um, and then this one's from Peter. Number four is Second Peter 2, 1 through 3. I put this one in there so that we could hear kind of another side of this. So we're hearing John say it. We're hearing Paul say it to Timothy. Here we're hearing... Peter, another of Jesus' inner circle disciples, um, and, and in, here, here, in, in this passage of Scripture, 
um, he tells us that um, there will be false prophets among the people, even as there will be false prophets among you, even in the latter times. And he goes on to say, and many will follow them. Uh, a warning right to us. And then from Jesus in the fifth one, Matthew 24, and I said verses 4 through 25. Uh, that's a very long passage of Scripture for you to study about what Jesus said um, concerning the coming of them. But a, a part of that that I want to kind of key on um, is in verse 24, um, where he says, For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. That's us. So, you know, that says a couple of things to, to us. Just, just based on those five passages, here's some three basic level takeaways on spiritual deception that we need to realize, okay? Um, spiritual deception, according to all of those five verses, will be at its peak in the last days. So it's always been around. It was around in John's time. It was around in Paul's time. It was around in Jesus' time. And in the Old Testament, there were false prophets that are alluded to in the New Testament, right? Janus and Jambres, right? And so, so it's always been around. But what we're saying is it will be a peak in the last times according to those five verses we just read. And we're living in those times. And it, I mean, it could get worse than it is even now, but but it's, it's spiritual deception is, is out there right now. So to me, studies like this are really um, important for a second. Basic level takeaway from those five verses, spiritual deception um, will be potent and powerful in the last days. <clears throat> it will be potent and powerful. Don't ever think as a believer that you're above falling and falling hard. Don't ever think, we need to approach the Lord humbly. We need to pray for him every day. God, would you just allow your Holy Spirit to help me be discerning today? Just pray for that. Pray that he would open your eyes to, to see the truth, to be, to be discerning, because I think we're living in times where the spiritual delusion and, and the spiritual deception of our age is very, very tricky to navigate, even, even for the church. Okay, And then the third basic kind of takeaway here, spiritual deception will potentially affect even the saved in the last days. I think that's a part of it being potent and powerful. That, that even Christians who maybe have been raised in the church and raised on the Word and have been taught, I, I hear examples of this, guys, of, of people who've raised their kids in church and then have, I, I know there's some in here that have shared testimonies about their own grandkids. They've raised, their kids have been raised in the church. They've been taught right from wrong. They go off to college and then they begin to question everything. That the spirit of deception is alive and well in our day. And, and many young people can be led astray by that. It's a part of why I think it's so important for us to have things like Awanas and strong VBS that teaches the Word of God and youth programs that, you know, I don't, I don't know. I'm glad Trey's going to teach next week, but I wish y'all could just go in there sometimes and hear the teaching in there. Trey, Trey, Trey does not do ministry with Kool-Aid and cookies. That's not his approach to ministry. He, he teaches hard truth in there. Sometimes um, he shares with me what he's teaching them. I say, Trey, you might need to, you might need to bring that down a little bit. That's, isn't that going to be over their head? But he's challenging them with, with powerful truth. We need to pray for that because those kids need to be discerning. Um, it's only going to get worse in their lifetime, the deception. So, so those are some takeaways from that basic, that basic verse that, um, that we need to think about tonight. Um, and, and I want us to get into it this evening. Um, if you look at our passage of Scripture, okay, really this discussion goes on um, all the way down to verse 27. I'm only doing verses 18 through 23, and only by God's grace are we going to get through that tonight. Okay, So, um, so I kind of cut this off, but but really, in, in verses 18, if, if you just look at your Bible there, all the way down to verse 27, um, he's talking about avoiding spiritual deception. He's, he's kind of giving us some help here as believers to, to help us be discerning in our day, um, to, to help us be wise, because spiritual deception is around us all the time. It was in his day, and that's why he's writing it and addressing it uh, to these believers. 
Uh, but really, this, these verses, 18 through 27, it can be kind of divided into three sections, okay? We're going to talk about two of them tonight. I'm going to give all three of them to you, okay? But I, I couldn't bite off. I probably bit off more than I could chew anyway. But um, So here's the three you're going to see. In verses 18 through 20 that we looked at, so if you just kind of remember what he says there, we'll, we'll be back to it here in a minute. In verses 18 through 20, um, he's going to talk about um, we avoid spiritual deception through discernment of others. Being discerning of others. And we'll talk about what, who the others are here in just a minute. Um, in, in these verses, verses 18 through 20, John shows us how to avoid deception, that you have to develop a discernment in regard to other people. You, you have to be discerning. I did not say distrustful, okay? Uh, distrustful is something a person earns. But be discerning. Um, you know, Jesus always said, and I quote this all the time to y'all, and really to me it's something so much of my Christian experience I've tried to meditate on and think about what he's saying. But Jesus told his disciples to be um, wise as serpents and harmless as doves. To me, that's what discernment looks like. Um, you don't have to be ugly to a person to be discerning, right? You don't, do, do you see what I'm saying? But, 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 but be discerning of others. So that's verses 18 through 20. The second section is verses 21 through 23, which we'll also look at tonight in the passage that I've kind of bit off. Um, and it has to do with avoiding spiritual discernment through discernment of doctrinal truth. And this is something you can do something about, okay? Um, it's why I think the preaching of God's Word, I'm not talking about flowery preaching that never gets around to the Word of God. I'm not talking about, you know, seeker-friendly preaching that never, that takes great pains never to step on anybody's toes or offend someone. I'm talking about the preaching of God's Word, how important that is, how important the teaching of God's Word is, that, and that we as believers sit under that, how important it is that we, we spend time reading God's Word everything because, every day because, listen, the only way that you can um, be discerning of doctrinal truth is to know doctrinal truth. You, you, cannot, you can't be discerning of what you're not grounded in, what you don't know to be true, and that's an, that's an alarming thing to me. I, I think I was preaching in First Baptist Church of Allen one time. And, and I, in the sermon at one point in there, I talked about who Jesus was, that Jesus was fully God and fully man. That, that Jesus, when he came in the flesh, was God in the flesh. And I quoted New Testament. And I had a, a senior man in that church that had been in that church before come up to me. He'd sat in that church for years and years and said, I've never heard that that i've never heard that jesus was god in the flesh and i wanted to go where have you been like i guarantee i'm not the first preacher to have said that in this church and i know i'm not the first sunday school teacher bible teacher you said under that's heard that how can you not have heard and i just started showing him in scripture like you know when the angel told told joseph you will call his name emmanuel for he will you know for he will be god with us and just passages like that. Listen, you would be surprised at how people have been in church for years and years and years. Just doctrinally, there's things they don't know. Now, what does that mean for us? They've set themselves up to be deceived. Spiritual deception. And if we're living in an age where that's getting worse, that's important. And I think that's why John's addressing that here. Little children, wake up and realize the Antichrist is coming, but there are antichrists already in the world who are spiritually deceiving believers. And so, so th th that's a very important truth. So the second thing there in verses 21 through 23, he shows us that you have to develop discernment with regard to doctrine. And the only way you can do that is to be doctrinally grounded. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
that's that's a good point. Yeah. And 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 we ought to recognize too in ourselves that we're vulnerable in some of those areas. There's there's parts of the truths about God and Scripture that we'd rather not talk about or deal with, and we kind of push those aside. We we need to delve deeply into God's truth and, and try to be grounded because listen, the enemy is out there deceiving, even today. So okay, here's the third part of this passage in verses 18 through 27, and this is the one I chose not to get into tonight. It's in verses 27, 24 through 27. And when I say not to get into, I'm not trying to hide from it. I think I'm biting off the toughest parts of this tonight, and you'll see why, because we're going to talk about the Antichrist and what that is, okay? So verses 24 through 27 talks about avoiding spiritual discernment through discernment by abiding in the Word of God. What, and, and, and in those verses, he talks about abiding in the Word of God, what that means. And that's a very important concept, abiding in. Um, it's not enough to read the Bible and study the Bible. We have to abide in its truth. And it has to do with the relationship with the Word, where it's in us, we're a part of it, it's a part of who we are, it's how we think, it's how we operate. That helps us to be discerning in the world we're in if we're abiding intimately in the Word. Um, every single day. That's a part of what helps us to think critically about things with a Christian worldview. So that's the one we're not going to get into tonight. We'll probably get into it in a couple of weeks when I'm back. We'll, we'll look at those verses most likely, okay? So let's, let's take those first two and just kind of pick them apart. So look at your Bible there if you've got it, and let's look at verses 18 through 20 again, because I want to get into this um, a little bit um, I know that the questions surrounding this passage, when you get to a passage like this, is talk about this Antichrist. Um, it seems like people who really like a lot of studies on things like prophecy and end time stuff, whenever they hear the word Antichrist, their ears perk up. Like, it just seems like it's one of those mysteries to us, one of those things that we're always trying to figure out. We never quite, can quite get our head around it. What is that? Well, first of all, it's a favorite word of John's. So we said, you know, John has these favorite words he uses over and over again. Um, John is the one who uses the word antichrist. Um, he uses it in these little letters, and he uses it in the book of Revelation, and it's, it's one of his favorite terms, okay? So um, that's a term that he uses. But remember, the word antichrist is an English translation of a Greek word, okay? So we give this kind of this big kind of honorary title to the Antichrist, like, you know, that's a, that's a, a Greek phrase, okay? Um, the against Christ, the, the against Messiah ones, okay? Um, but we'll get into that tonight. So look at verses 18 to 20. Here's what he says. Little children, it is the last hour. If it was the last hour in John's day, what is it today? <laughs> that's... Please remember that when you're reading that. If it was the last hour then, we're in the last seconds, okay? Um, little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming. That's important, okay? But he goes on. Even now, many, many Antichrists have come. And if you look at that, the first Antichrist he mentions that's coming is capitalized. The others are small letter. That's significant. Um, so as you've heard, the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have come, and we've got lots of them in our world today, by which we know that it is the last hour or seconds. They went out from us, but they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that, we might, that they might be made manifest or shown that we might be able to discern them that none of them were of us but you have an anointing from the holy one and you know all things okay so there's bad news good news there okay that that we're living in the last times the antichrist is coming and even now there are antichrists among us and and it's a, it's a word a phrase that we see really here now John here is contrasting the false teachers with true believers, in a sense. He tells them to, to be, be aware, be, open your eyes and recognize it, but he also tells them, but, but don't fret it, because the Holy One is with you. He's anointed you, so that you will know, okay? So we don't have to be afraid. There's nothing to be afraid of here. So 
I always think that's really important. You know, when we get to Revelation chapter 13 and it's talking about the beast coming out above the sea and all this stuff is happening, the Antichrist, and we all shake and quiver, right? But what I always think is those are great passages of God's victory, right? Because as believers, listen, there is nothing the enemy can throw at us, right? He is a defeated foe. And so I, I think we need to look at those kind of things um, with, with hope in what we're saying. Now, he says in verse 18, it is the last hour. Uh, the, the way that we know it's the last hour is that he says many antichrists have come. That, that gives evidence that it's the last hour. And that, that's, that's really important. Um, John is kind of giving us some help in this passage of Scripture. I think um, kind of gives us some ways to kind of navigate this idea. And again, I'm going to tell you that it's a, it's a favorite word of his. I want to give you, because um, I think this helps us kind of begin to understand what this is. What, what is this Antichrist that's coming and this little A Antichrist that are already in the world? Let's just kind of get your Bible there, put something in there to mark um, our passage in, in 2 John chapter 2. And I'm going to give you five uses of the word Antichrist just in John here. Okay, let's just march through it because I think this is important for you to see this. It's a word that he uses throughout these little letters and you, you need to see this. I think it's important. So um, he's going to use it twice um, in verse 18. So 1 John 2, 18a is the first one. Little children, it's the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, um, that's important. Now, now, now just kind of hang on that one for a second. The second one appears in 1 John 2, 18b. Even now many antichrists, small a, have come, by which we know it's the last hour. Okay, and then if you want to flip over to uh, verse 22 of chapter 2 of 1 John. So 1 John 2, 22. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is antichrist who denies the father and the son so there's that word again now, the reason i'm giving these to you is because i want us to understand who the antichrist is i'm not trying to give you a name i'm trying to tell you who he is what scripture tells us about this one it's it's interesting that the scripture doesn't tell us who it is we're always running around trying to figure out who it is right if the bible thought we needed to know who it is it would spell it out what he wants us to know is who he is by what he does so that we can be discerning to recognize it okay so first john 2 22 the fourth one is turn over to chapter 4 first john 4 3 just flip over there john's going to give us some further qualifiers so we understand who this is he's talking about and every spirit that does not confess that jesus christ has come in the flesh is not of god and this is the spirit of the Antichrist, with a capital A, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. Okay? That's interesting. And then Second John, the second letter, we're going to find one reference to the Antichrist in the second letter that we're going to look at down the road. Second John, there's only one chapter, Second John verse 7. For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Now, what John just did was give you the tools to be discerning. So what were some of the things you noticed in there about the antichrist? He's a, dece he's, he's a deceiver. So now, and, and that's an interesting statement about him because if he's a deceiver, that means it, it, he looks good, right? But, some, but, but what did, you, did you notice anything else? They're already in the world. And you can recognize them in the world. How? It's what they do with Jesus. Every time, it's what they do with Jesus. Twice there, he says, um, in our passage of Scripture, he says they deny that Jesus is the Christ. They deny that Jesus is come in the flesh. They deny that Jesus was God. They deny that. So, so there's some 
discernment factors in there, right? That you can see. But, but I want you to see that, that Antichrist is not just a word that appears um, or we think appears in the book of Revelation. John uses that word often to describe a spirit of the age and says, actually gives them this title, there are actually Antichrists in the world today that, that deny the authority and power the Messiahship, the Christhood of, of Jesus, his, his deity, who he is and what he does. Listen close today to what's being taught and said in some mainline churches about who Jesus is. Listen close. Listen, listen close. Be discerning and he will help you to discern the spirit of the Antichrist in even some of the churches today. I tell you that's the truth. Um, so, but, but that's not the only word that's used to describe this one. I'm going to give these to you because these are some other passages of Scripture. Um, three other names, references for the Antichrist that you'll find in the Bible. And, and these are very, very significant. Um, again, whether you're looking at Daniel or the book of Revelation or wherever you go, the Bible's not going to tell you who the Antichrist is. He's going to tell you what he's like, how to discern him, how to, be, how to recognize him, how to... Do you see? And that's a really important thing for us to understand. We, we, we can be discerning. We can recognize what's false. We don't have to be deceived by it. Uh, but here's some other names or references for the Antichrist. I'm not going to have time to read all of these passages, but I'm going to give some of this to you. In Daniel chapter 7, the Antichrist is called the horn. H-O-R-N. Not the long horn. I don't want to hear that. The horn. <laughs> He's called the horn. In Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 7, Old Testament reference. Remember that, that Daniel um, kind of overlaps Revelation in some ways uh, with, with some end time prophecy, but those books were also written for a specific time, a specific people, specific situation. They have a present day um, application for when they were written, but they also are prophetic in that they, they write about us. Now remember that the book of Daniel, most of Daniel, and the book of Revelation are what's called apocalyptic literature, okay? So that means end times. They're, they're about their end times. And apocalyptic literature is always written in figurative language. That doesn't mean it shouldn't be interpreted literally, okay? It means that they use figurative language. What, what are we saying? They use a lot of symbols, a lot of, a lot of pictures and and things like that that had meaning for, the, for, for that day. So our, our goal is to get at what that means. So in Daniel chapter 7, um, he's talking about these horns that come up out of the sea. And a beast comes up that has ten horns. And then another beast comes up that destroys three of those horns. And then another beast comes up that has the face of a man and does all these things. And it talks about this horn, okay? And, and so if you kind of study that, you'll discover that that horn is, is making reference to world leaders that come up, um, powers among the nations of that day. In Daniel, it would, it would kind of be a reference to some of the kings that were in existence around in that area that would rise up and be very powerful. And there would be wars and these three kings would be taken out. And then there would be one king. And, and in Daniel 7, it's really interesting because the, the Antichrist there, the reference there is called the little horn, which, which refers to a lowly political origin of this one that would, res, des, would, would ascribe to a great place of prominence and respect in the world uh, by what the little horn does. And that's a reference to this Antichrist. So um, he's, he's telling us something about, you know, this one would come up from, from very humble origins and Many people would not even recognize it as being a great power, but all of a sudden powerful things would come from and many people would begin to turn to them and worship them and follow them. Spiritual deception. You see it? So that's the little horn. The, the next term for the Antichrist is in Revelations chapter 13, and that's the beast. It's the one that you've, you've heard before, the beast. Now it's interesting when you compare Revelations chapter 13 and Daniel 7, that it's the same story that's coming up out of the sea and there's 10 and this is what the beast looks like and then another beast comes up that destroys these three 
and then a, another beast that doesn't look as strong but has the face of a man. It sounds just like Daniel, but instead of the word horn, it uses the word beast. Another term for the Antichrist, okay? So, or the Antichrist that are in the world. Now, now think about this reference. Um, before you get caught up in the figurative language of Revelation chapter 13, and there's a lot of figurative language in the book of Revelation, think about what a beast does. A beast. What does a beast do? Yeah. It preys on people. It stalks. It preys. It takes its enemy down by, by deceit and hunting, for the, hunting them out. Um, there, there's some very interesting analogies in there about what the beast does. Preys on those who are spiritually vulnerable, who will fall prey to his tactics. Um, and, and even today that's happening. How can you protect yourself against the beast? You know his tactics. You know what he does. You're discerning so that you don't become spiritually deceived. And then Paul's going to use a term. So remember that the term Antichrist is really John's term, okay? Um, Paul's going to use a word in Thessalonians, that, and, and he calls the Antichrist the man of lawlessness. The man of lawlessness. That's, that's pretty interesting if you think about it. All, all these different terms, and, and so we hang on the term Antichrist, but there's a spirit of the age today that is filled with Antichrist, okay? And, and, and as John said, we know, we've heard the Antichrist is coming, and I tell you that even now, many Antichrists are in the world, and they are, so you need to be discerning spiritually. You need to recognize that and what that means. Um, the pre Greek prefix that's translated in our Bibles as anti means instead of or in opposition to, against, okay? So that Greek word anti, anti, um, we know that. What does an antibiotic do? Antibiotic. That comes from the Greek word anti. What does it do? It is in opposition to, or it fights against, infections, right? You get it? Um, so, so you get where that term comes from. So when you see the word antichristos, it's in opposition to Christ. So that tells you where he comes from. Who is in opposition to Christ? The enemy, right? He's under the sway of the enemy. Yes, ma'am. Get it. It's 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. That's the main place where he talks about the man of lawlessness. I, yes, I'm sorry I didn't give that to you. So Daniel 7 is the horn, the little horn, if y'all got that. Revelations 13 is the beast. And 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 4 is the man of lawlessness. It describes the man of lawlessness there, which is an important passage of Scripture because Paul paints a picture of this one as well. Okay? Um. So I'm going, to, I'm going to give these to you. So I, these are some guidelines for watching, to watch for, to be discerning uh, in our day. When you watch for the spirit of Antichrist in our day, when you, when you look for that. And, and remember these kind of terms that we've kind of given, given for the Antichrist. But, but these are some things that kind of emerge even based on Scripture and, you know, from discernment today of, of what's false. So uh, some possible... So, I'm going to give you these three guidelines for being discerning. Okay, so the first guideline is beware Satan works in the realm of religion. He does. Why do you think there's so much spiritual deception in the church? That's where the enemy works. He, he works in the realm of religion. False teachers invariably adopt Christian terminology. They posture themselves as being Christians often, but they're not. Um, and and this is that passage of Scripture where John even says uh, they went out from us because they were never of us. If they'd been of us, they would have remained with us. But they did not remain with us because they were not of us. And he makes that confusing statement. What's he telling us? That, that, that this enemy of Christ works in the realm of religion. That, that's, that's where Satan's going to attack. Okay? Um, now, here's some of those possible recognizable characteristics of these kind of deceptive false teachers or false Christ, antichrist that we see even in our day. Number one, they appear orthodox. They, they appear orthodox. Orthodoxy is a, a big word that we use. What does it mean when something is orthodox? 
You know, real, true. If, it, if, if when we speak of Christian orthodoxy, we're talking about basic Christian doctrine and theology, the truth of Scripture, they appear to be orthodox. They usually begin within the church. At first, their teachings may sound orthodox, but be discerning. If they deny the Christ, that's a red flag, okay? Second, often have a charismatic personality, a personality that draws, that motivates subtly. Um, remember that the enemy was a charismatic angel at one time before he fell. It was the choir director, Nancy. Yeah. He could sing. And the Bible says that he was more beautiful than all the other angels. He had a very charismatic personality. Uh, third, um, they justify immorality. That's, that's interesting. I think about that one today some how we are hearing and hearing it adopted even within many churches today, this justifying of immorality. It really is happening. Um, third, fourth, they're often popular and wealthy. Um, they love acclaim. They love being recognized. And usually with that comes great financial reward from, their fo from the followers. They have power and control, number five. Because of all the ones listed above, they acquire followers. Seven, they will usually show up as unchallenged leadership. Unchallenged leadership. They've usually grown so powerful that no one dares to test or challenge their lifestyle or what they teach. People just believe it gullibly. That's why you must be discerning. And eight, religious. In spite of their perhaps subtle deviance, they still traffic in the realm of religion. They appear religious. So th those are just some things. For now, the reason that I think that he gives these to us in the study is for us to recognize how those things can be deceptive, how easy it is to fall prey to that, okay? This, the next guideline for watching is number two guideline here. Beware of anyone who breaks from the true church to form a new group with a new theology. <clears throat> Beware of anyone who breaks from the true church to form a new group with a new theology. And that is happening today. Um, what is the true church? Well, it's, is it that little rock church that sits on a back road of Buda that has the name First Baptist Church of Buda on it? No, that's a building. <laughs> what is the true church? It's a body of believers, okay? Um, when there is a break from the true body of Christ, the church, to form a new group with a new theology with their own ways of teaching it and looking at it and We'll kind of dig into this just a little bit more here. Um, then that's when, okay, my time's gone, so I've got to move quick here, all right? Um, some issues that we need to think about biblically kind of under this second one, all right? Remember that true Christians are born of God. They're not man-made. Christians are not man-made, all right? They're born of God. Second, if you truly know Christ, you will persevere with the church. There, there's, um, I'm, I'm not saying that we judge someone a Christian or not a Christian based on what they do, but their relationship to the church is very telling. That's what we talked about Sunday when I was preaching on the change. A part of that is what's your, what is your relationship to the body of Christ, the church? Um, a, a, a person who truly knows Christ recognizes the importance of the church for them. And it's, it's not about a building or, or a service you go to. It's about being connected to the body of Christ. It's, it's about the body of Christ. Third, note that John was more concerned about purity of doctrine than he was about church growth or unity. He was more concerned about purity of doctrine here. And, and that's significant to me. 
because it's so easily easy to be deceived. Okay. All right. Here's the third one. Let me give this to you. And let me see if I can jump through this. I'd like to give this stuff to y'all. So can y'all just bear with me for a second? I'll just run through these. The third thing is beware of anyone who offers new truth that others have missed. I think about this sometimes, and I'm always guarded when I say it. You know, studying this passage, this, and I've never noticed this before. I say this sometimes when I'm preaching. Like, this struck me different. I've never noticed this before, and I'll share something that I saw in Scripture that I had never really seen before. I'm always cautious about that because I want to be sure that I'm not communicating to you that I found new truth that had never been found before. I'm, I'm always conscious of that when I say that. I'm not, I'm not saying when I, that I'm saying that, you know, God showed me something about myself or something in this passage that I've never seen before. It's not that it's new truth. It's that I hadn't seen it before. But beware of someone who says, I have found new truth that's outside of the authority of God's word. That's what we're talking about here, okay? All right, let's go to the next one there. And I'm just gonna, I'm gonna run through these and just give them to you. Um, to avoid spiritual deception, be discerning of doctrine. And remember I said a while ago, the only way to be discerning of doctrine is to know doctrine. Now, let me give you these three implications of absolute truth of the Scripture, of God's Word. Number one, and these are so basic, sound doctrine really matters. Sound doctrine really matters. Don't let anybody tell you doctrine is boring. I don't want to hear a lecture on doctrine. I don't want to do a Bible study on doctrine. Sound doctrine is absolutely essential for us believers. We can't recognize what's false if we don't know what's true. Okay? Second, sound doctrine is intimately linked with a personal relationship with God. Sound doctrine does not come from man. It comes from God. It comes from God's word to us. It is not important what Buddy says about God's word. It's important what God's word says. And when I preach or teach, my goal is to try to get at what God is saying, not what I want to say about it. Okay, so that's really important. And then third, sound doctrine about the person and work of Jesus Christ is absolutely essential. It ought to all point back to Jesus, who he is, why he came, okay? All right, now I can give you these, this, these conclusions and we'll be done. To avoid spiritual deception, number one, be discerning of people. I did not say be distrustful, I didn't say be unkind. I did not say question everything somebody does. I didn't even say that. I said be discerning. You know, don't fall hook, line, and sinker for every good thing somebody else says. Be discerning of people. Second, I'm sorry? Yeah. Second, be discerning of sound doctrine. No sound doctrine so you can be discerning of it. Third, know your Bible well. This fourth one's just going to blow you away and say, what are you talking about? Study systematic theology. Study systematic theology. And I know you're going to go, what is that? Look it up. Study theology. Theology is the study of God. Theos is God. Ology is the study of. The study of God. Make the study of God and who he is the height of your life as a believer. And, and, and study it systematically. That means there's a system to theology. Study what it means to be saved. That's called soteriology. Okay? Um, pneumatology. Study the Holy Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit? What does the Bible say about the... Study who Jesus is. Christology. Okay? All of that's a part of systematic theology. Make it your practice to understand who he is. And then third, study church history. Our history as Christians and as the church is not always perfect, but it's teachable. It's a teaching lesson. We should learn from the past. There's nothing new under the sun. If, if there were many antichrists in the world in John's day, are there any today? If, if he says it is the last hour, then we're in the last seconds, and it's even more present today. So we need to be discerning. All right. Thanks, guys. I hope that's good and encouraging, not scary. All right, go ahead.
Exactly. What are they? They're, they're antichrists. That, if, matter of fact, if you get Walter Martin's book, I looked at this today. If you get King, uh, Kingdom of the Cults, great classic book written by Walter Martin, and you read it, he gives you characteristics of the cults, and you're going to hear the same stuff. He's going to say, um, cults claim to have new truth. Cults will deny the deity of Christ. He'll say the same stuff that John is telling us in here about false prophets, false teachers in our time. He'll say the same thing. Because that's exactly what they are. That's a good point. Kingdom of the Cults by Walter Martin. Walter Martin was, I mean, he, man, what a godly guy. He died of Alzheimer's back in the 70s. But that book is still considered a classic. The Kingdom of the Cults. And it's a really good reference. It, it takes most of the cults and explains all about them, their tenets, what they believe. And um, he wrote some others, but Kingdom of the Cults is a really good one. That's a big question. <laughs> Be discerning. Be discerning. Uh, many people take Jonathan Kahn's books to be like great theology books. He's, he's a fiction writer. Do remember that. Now, a lot of it's historical fiction, right? So, yeah, it's his interpretation of a lot of prophetic stuff that's in Scripture, which is fine. It's his interpretation, but do realize that. Um, so, I mean, I, don't, I would not dismiss him outright. Some of his stuff is, I would be discerning. But I, I would say be discerning of any Christian author. If Buddy wrote a book, I would say be discerning of that. I might have been having a bad day, and you know, I don't know. I mean, you know, I mean, we're human, right? We can say things sometimes that are off. So, okay, let me pray, and we'll be dismissed because I know there's people waiting to come in. Father, we thank you for your love for us, God. When we do studies like this, or when I'm digging into scripture like this with the, with the past, God, I can't help but praise you and thank you that you don't leave us out there to swim and get sucked in by the current, but God, you give us everything we need to live this Christian life in such a way that it honors you. God, help us to um, lean into that, to um, take advantage of every opportunity you've given us to grow in the faith, to be doctrinally grounded, to be discerning through your Holy Spirit. Forgive us for how we grieve and quench your spirit sometimes in this world today and fall prey to things. God, help us as believers to hold forth the word of truth. Give us eyes to see and recognize and call it by name what is false today. God, help us to do it all in such a way that others would be drawn to Christ and not pushed away from him, but help us to hold out that light. And God, I pray that as believers, you would make us spiritually discerning of what's going on around us. Dismiss us in your grace tonight. It's in your name we ask these things. Amen. All right. Thank you guys for coming tonight.